He wants to be able to at least pay for the, all these provisions and things. So he has to set up sort of a commissariat and all the logistics to pay for his men. Um, so here's a quote from him from around this time. He said, um, it is very necessary to attend to all the detail for proper food supply and to trace a biscuit from it being landed at a peninsula port into the man's mouth and provide for its removal from place to place by land or water. There's so many, so well, so few other empires in history would have had any sort of consideration for such a thing. It's just, it's unfathomable <laughs> to think that it's right. anyone other than the British, possibly mm. the Americans, you know? Like, it's just such an unusual thing for us to give a damn about that in just in all of human history. Mm. But, yeah. Yeah, but why haven't you just killed the inhabitants and taken their stuff? But, I mean, that is one way of doing it. Or we could set up a bureaucracy and run it properly. Yeah. And that is exactly what Napoleon does all over Europe yeah. and in Spain and Portugal, is just... Uh, to sort of rape the land yeah. for everything you need. I'm here for human rights. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, yeah. he's like, I'm here for aristocracy and tradition. Also, here's a proper bureaucracy. <laughs> you know, we're going to pay for everything we take. You know, it's like, I'm sorry, there's just two ways of doing things, and one's clearly the right way. Yeah, Napoleon, I'm here for egalitarianism, yeah. liberty, yeah. and fraternity among men. Yeah. By the way, I'm robbing everything you've got. <laughs> yeah. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. And if you stand up to me, we'll kill you. Yeah. Okay. Compared to the, you know, stuffy old aristocratic traditionalists who aren't here for any higher values, but they do happen to make the place better wherever they go. Mm. Just remarkable. Once again, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, so I want to read a long quote now, if I can, from Oman. Um, and it just says a lot, a lot of things. Um, just about about Wellesley, about how he conducted himself, how he conducted war. Um, and we can break it down afterwards, mm. or feel free to interrupt. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, I will, I will. Um, but it says quite a lot, and it bounces around throughout the whole Peninsula War, so I'll mention things that happen years from now, but mm. we'll go back and we'll talk about them. Um, but it, we'll give examples. So, Sir Charles O'Man wrote this in his book, um, The History of the Peninsula War. He said, quote, it is with the survey of documents such as these, they're the two dispatches I mentioned earlier, um, that enables us to appreciate Wellesley at his best. He had gauged perfectly well the situation and difficulties of the French. He saw exactly how much was in his own power. The whole history of the Peninsula War for the next two years is foreseen in his prophetic statement that with 30,000 British troops and the Portuguese levies, he would guarantee to hold his own against any force less than 100,000 French, and that he did not think that, any would, uh, that they would find it easy to collect an army of that size to send against him. This is precisely what he accomplished. For the first 15 months after his arrival, he held with ease that frontier which Moore, Sir John Moore, had described as indefensible against the superior force. When at last Napoleon, free from all other continental, continental troubles, an, arm, an army under Messina, an army which almost reached that figure which he had described as indefensible in 1809. He showed in 1810-11 um, that he had built up, he, Wellesley, um, had built up resources for himself which enabled him to beat off even that number of enemies. Though four-fifths of Spain had been subdued, he held his own because he grasped the fundamental truth of, to his own words, the more ground the French hold down, the weaker... Uh, they will be at any given point. In short, he had fathomed the great secret that Napoleon's great military power, vast as it was, had its limits, that the emperor could not send to Spain a force sufficient to hold down every province of a thoroughly dissatisfied country and also to provide, over and above the garrisons, a field army large enough to beat the Anglo-Portuguese and to capture Lisbon. If the French dispersed their divisions and kept down the vast tracts of conquered territory, they had no force left with which to take the offensive against Portugal. If they massed their armies, uh, they had to give up broad, broad regions, which immediately relapsed into insurrection and, and required to be subdued again. This was true at the beginning of the war as at the end. In 1809, the army that had forced Wellesley to retreat after Talavera was only produced by evacuating the whole province of Galicia, which passed back in, into the hands um, of the insurgents. In 1812, in a similar way, 
The overwhelming force that beat him back from Burgos had been gathered only by surrendering to the Spanish government the whole of the four kingdoms of Andalusia. On the other hand, during the long periods when the enemy had dispersed himself and was, garrison, and was garrisoning the whole of the south and central Spain, for example, the first six months of 1810 and the last six months of 1811, Wellesley held his own on the Portuguese frontier in complete confidence, assured that no sufficient force could be brought up against him till the enemy either produced new troops from France or gave up some great region of uh, some great section of the regions which he was holding down. A detailed insight into the future is impossible to any general, however great, but already in April 1809, Wellesley had grasped the main outlines of the war that was to be. It is well to take a glance at the man himself as he sat at his desk in Lisbon, dictating the orders which were to change the face of the war. Arthur Wellesley uh, was within a few days of completing his 40th year. He was a slight yet wiry man of middle stature, with a long face and aquiline nose, and a keen but cold grey eye. Owning an iron constitution upon which no climate or season seemed to make the least impression, he was physically fit for all the work that lay before him, work more fatiguing than that which falls to most generals. For in the peninsula he was required, as soon as it appeared, to be almost as much of a statesman as of a general, while at the same time, owing to the inexperience of the British officers of the day, of warfare on a large scale, he was obliged for some time to, dis to discharge himself for many of the same uh, for many of the duties that properly f fall to the lot of a chief of staff, the commissary general, the paymaster general, and the quartermaster general in a well organized army. No amount of toil, bodily or mental, appeared too much for that active and alert mind, or for the body which seven years of service in India seemed to have tanned and hardened rather than to have relaxed. During the whole of the Peninsula campaign from 1808 to 1814, he was never prostrated by any serious ailment. Autumn rains, summer heat, the cold of winter had no power over him. He could put up with a very small allowance of sleep, and when necessary could snatch useful moments of repose at any moment of the 24 hours when no pressing duty chanced to be, to be upon hand. His manner of life was simple and austere in the extreme. No commander-in-chief ever travelled with less baggage or could be content with more Spartan fare. Long after his wars were over, uh, the habit of bleak frugality clung to him, and in his old age men wondered at the bare and comfortless surroundings that he chose for himself, and at the scanty meals that sustained his spare but active frame. Officers which had long served in India were generally supposed to contract habits of luxury and display, but, but Wellesley uh, was the exception which proved the rule. He hated show of any kind. After the first few days of the campaign in 1809, uh, he discarded the escort uh, which was wont to accompany the commander-in-chief. It was on very rare occasions that he was seen in his full uniform, the, ar the army knew him best in his plain blue frock coat, uh, the small featherless cocked hat and the short cape, which has been handed down to us in a hundred drawings. Not unfrequently, he would ride about in, in his cantonments, dressed like a civilian, in a round hat and grey trousers. Um, I haven't written it here, but there's... Um, old man goes off on a tangent about how he allowed lots of his senior officers to do the same. Mm. Even Picton fought Waterloo in a top hat. They called it Mufti. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, he was careless about the dress of his subordinate, uh, subordinates as about his own, uh, and there probably never existed an army in which so little fuss was made about unessential trappings as that which served in the peninsula from 1809 to 1814. Um, there's another quote here from a... a, 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 a a junior, a junior officer called Grattan who fought in the 88th, which is, which is the Connaught Rangers, quite a famous regiment. He said, uh, Provided we brought our men into the field well appointed and with 60 good rounds in their pouches, he never looked to see whether our trousers were black or blue or grey. Scarcely any two officers dressed alike. Some wore grey braided coats, others brown, some like blue. Many from, many from choice or necessity stuck with the old red rag. We were, we were never tormented with that greatest of bores on active service, uniformity of dress. 
Nothing could be less showy. Oh, that's the end of that quote. Omar goes on. Um, Nothing could be less showy than his headquarters staff, a small group of blue coated officers with an orderly dragoon or two riding in the wake of the dark cape and the low glazed cock hat, cocked hat of, the, of this most unpretentious of chiefs. In contrast, in the strangest, in the strangest white way uh, were the plumes and gold lace of the French marshals and their elaborately ornate staffs. Again, Oman goes on to talk all about how at least some of the cavalry officers were just ridiculously over the top mm -hmm. in the French. Mm -hmm. They were allowed to sort of design their own uniforms and they got more and more ridiculous mm -hmm. and ornate. And they, they were like, you know, they were part tailor as well as general. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, Sir, uh, Sir Arthur didn't go in for any of that kind of nonsense. Thank you very much. Um, Oman goes on. Considered as a man, Wellesley has his defects and his limitations. We shall have ere long to draw attention to some of them. I'll actually talk about probably most of those next time mm -hmm. when we talk about his political career yeah. and some of his other sort of personal faults and details in his marriage and all sorts of things. Um, Oman says, uh, but from an intellectual point of view, uh, he commands our undivided admiration as a practical soldier. Lord Roberts, in his Rise of Wellington, only slightly overstates the case when he observes that the more we study Wellesley's life in detail, the more we res respect him as a general and the less we like him as a man. If we, come, if we come upon much which is a harsh and unsympathetic, there are too many redeeming traits to justify the statement in its entirety. A careful study of his dispatches leaves us in a state of wonder at the imbecility of the school of writers, mostly continental, who have continued to assert for the last 80 years, remember Oman's writing right at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, who have continued to assert for the last 80 years that he was a man of no more than ordinary abilities, who had an unfair share of good luck, and who was presented with a series of victories by the mistakes and jealousies of the generals opposed to him. Such assertions are, are the result of blind ignorance and prejudice. When found in English writers, they merely ref reflect the bitter hatred which was felt towards w Wellesley by his political opponents during the second and third decades of the 19th century. So as I say, he goes on after his military career to be in cabinet and then prime minister mm. twice, once, neither for very long, and the second time was very, very, very briefly. But anyway, goes on to be prime minister, Tory prime minister, and um, obviously his political opponents, or even opponents within his own party, uh, they did sort of attack him. Mm. and stuff but um oman saying here that it was you know it's completely unfounded in terms of just sort of pure military in pure military terms oman goes on in french military authors they only represent the resentful carpings of the vanquished army uh, which prefer to think that it was beaten by anything rather than by the ability of the conqueror in mm. 1820 i.e after waterloo and everything um in 1820 every retired colonel across the channel was, was ready to demonstrate that Toulouse was an English defeat. It wasn't. That Talavera was a, a drawn battle. It wasn't. And that Wellesley was over rash or over cautious, a fool or a coward, according to their thesis of the moment. Um, Bonaparte consistently refused to do, to do justice to the abilities of the Duke. He regarded him as a bitter personal enemy to clear away any, uh, to clear away any lingering doubts as to Wellesley's extraordinary ability, the student of history has only to read a few of his more notable dispatches. The man who could write the two memoranda to Castlereagh foresaw the whole future of the Peninsula War. Uh, to know that, uh, to know at that early stage of the struggle that the Spaniards would be beaten when and wherever they offered battle, that the French, in spite of their victories, would never be able to conquer and hold down the entire country. The 30,000 British troops would be able to defend Portugal against any force that, that could be collected against them, required the mind of a soldier of the first class. How many generals has the world seen who could frame such a prophecy and have verified it? To talk of the good fortune of Wellesley, of his lucky star, is absurd. He had, like other generals, his occasional uncovenanted uh, mercies and happy chances, but few commanders had more strokes of undeserved disappointment or saw more of their plans frustrated by a stupid subordinate, an unexpected turn of the weather, an incalculable accident or a piece of false news. He had his fair proportion of the chances of war, good and bad, and no more. If, 
Um, if Fortune was with him at Oporto in 1809 or at El Badon in 1811, how many were the occasions on which it played him a scurvy trick? A few, occasion, uh, a few examples may suffice. In May 1809, he might have captured the whole of Salt's army if Silviera had but obeyed orders. On the night of Salamanca, he might have dealt a similar, in similar manner with Marmont's routed host. It is needless to multiply examples of such incalculable misfortune. Any serious student of the Peninsular War uh, can cite them in the dozen. Messina's invasion of Portugal in 1810 would have been checked by the autumn rains and would never have penetrated far within the frontier, but for the unlucky bomb which blew up the Grand Magazine at Almeida and reduced in a day a fortress which ought to have held out for a month. In the autumn of 1812, uh, uh, the retreat beyond the Duro need never have been made if Ballesteros had obeyed orders and had moved up from Granada to threaten Salt's flank. Wellington was not the child of fortune. He was a great strategist and a tactician, placed in a situation in which the military dangers furnished but half of his difficulties. He had to cherish his single British army corps and to keep it from any unnecessary loss, because if destroyed, it could not be replaced. Right down to 1812, it was certain that if he had lost any considerable fact faction of his modest army, the ministry might have recalled him and abandoned Portugal. He had to fight with the full consciousness that a single disaster would have been irreparable. His French opponents fought under no such disabilities. Goes on to say how they had multiple army groups, army corps in Spain, mm. and that French the Napoleon system of recruiting more men was brilliant. Yeah, he could just call on. He could very very quickly call up loads more men, oh, yeah. um, and we couldn't. We just could not do that really. Oman, Oman goes on. Considering the campaigns of 1809, 10 and 11, it is not Wellington's oft-censured prudence which we find astonishing, but his boldness. Instead of wondering why he did not attempt to relieve Rodrigo or Almeida in July and August of 1810, uh, or to fall upon Massena uh, at Centaurum in January 1911, we are filled with surprise at the daring which inspired the storming of Oporto and the offering of battle at Busico and Fuentes de Orono. When a defeat spelt ruin and recall, it, it required no small courage to take any risks. Um, but Wellesley had the sanest of minds. He could draw the line with absolute accuracy between enterprise and rashness, between the possible and the impossible. He had learned to gauge with, gauge with wonderful insight the difficulties and disabilities of his enemies and to see exactly how far they might be reckoned upon in discounting the military situation. After some time, he arrived at the accurate estimate of the individual marshals opposed to him and was ready to take the personal equation into, consider into consideration, according uh, as he had to deal with Salt or Messina, Marmont or Jordan. In short, he was a safe general, not a cautious one. Very nearly finished here, last couple of sentences. When once the hopeless disparity between his own resources and those of the enemy had ceased to exist in the year 1812, he soon showed uh, the worth of the silly taunts which imputed timidity to him. Uh, by the smashing blows which reduced Ciudad Rodrigo and Badillos, and the lightning stroke which dashed to pieces Marmont's army at Salamanca. End quote. So that's a brilliant passage there. Mm. I absolutely love that. Because um, it says so much, it just paints a great picture, I think. Mm. Um, says loads and loads of different things. <clears throat> but the idea that he is anything less than one of the great generals of all time, um, just doesn't seem fair. I mean, given the, I, I like the highlighting the disparity of resource because mm. the, this was Napoleon's tactic, right? This is why change came to Germany is they, they, they had to start levying in the same way that the French did in order to just be able to field because Napoleon's first famous saying, I spent, they can't beat me. I spend 20,000 lives a month. This is just men, it's just manpower. To him. So he'll just call up more. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.